So shall we start? Welcome everyone to uh, the 14th AO Talks of uh, our summer fall season. Uh, on behalf of um, Usama Gad, Rachel Mears, and myself, I'm very happy to welcome you for this talk by uh, my dear friend and colleague, Dimitri Nakassis. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dimitri, a little housekeeping in case you haven't been with us so far. Those of you who've been to other talks know how it works by now. Um, so thank you everyone for keeping your mics and cameras off during uh, the talk. Uh, Dimitri's talk will last about uh, half an hour and after that we'll have a Q&A. So I'm going to share the Q&A. You're welcome to uh, post any question you have in the chat box at the end of the talk. And if you want to ask a question in private, you can uh, send it to me uh, in private via the chat. So now let me introduce uh, Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri Nakassis is professor and also chair of the Department of Classics at the University of uh, Colorado Boulder. Uh, he is the author of Individuals and Society in Mycenaean Pilos and co-director of the Western Argolid Regional Project. And he's also the director of the Pilos Tablets Digital Project. So today, uh, Dimitri will uh, give a talk entitled, Not in any significant or proper sense, dot, 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 Greek, Orientalism, and the Mycenaeans. Dimitri, the floor is yours. Thanks, Katrine. Um, let me see if I can share my screen here. Is that working? Yes, it is. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thanks to uh, Katrine and um, and Rachel and Usama um, for the invitation uh, to speak to you today. Um, and uh, let me see, what else should I say? Um, yeah, I'll try to keep this to about half an hour so we've got time for Q&A. Um, and I'll apologize, I was telling Katrine earlier today that this is uh, not the most um, exciting PowerPoint you guys will ever see. It's a lot of quotations from uh, from scholars because I'm trying to um, sort of trace a, a discourse that I think is uh, really prevalent and also um, and, and really problematic. So uh, with that out of the way, I'll, I'll get going. Okay, so um, in his 2009 uh, book, Ancient Greece, Paul Cartledge makes the unusual, and in my opinion, a good choice, of stretching his historical survey of Greece into prehistory by including Knossos and Mycenae as the first two cities in his 11 city tour. So this is a kind of introductory historical textbook um, almost with um, each chapter dedicated to a different city. But he also strangely undercuts that decision when he expresses the view that the Minoan civilization of Bronze Age Crete wasn't, and I quote, ever Greek at all in any sense. Um, primarily because Linear A, the script of Minoan Crete, is certainly not Greek. Um, when Cartledge moves on to Mycenae, uh, he writes that, and I quote, uh, though Greek in language, the civilization of Mycenaean Greece was in most other basic respects a provincial outpost of a Middle Eastern culture whose epicenters lay in Egypt, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, he substantiates this by pointing to some architectural similarities between the Greek mainland and the Hittites, um, Babylon, and Egypt. Uh, and he observes that the clay tablets of Linear B, um, the, the, the documents of the Mycenaean world, had a documentary bureaucratic function. Um, on the following page, uh, Cartledge concludes that Mycenaean culture and society represented, in Hellenic retrospect, a false start. Uh, these views are neither idiosyncratic to Cartledge, uh, nor is he the first to express them. Far from it, in fact. He's rather summarizing a view that's become dominant, especially but not exclusively in Anglo-American historical writing. This view is expressed both by scholars who are hostile to the Bronze Age, like Victor Davis Hanson, who compares uh, the Mycenaean agricultural regime to communist farms, um, and those who are sympathetic to it, like Edith Hall. Um, Hall, in fact, writes that uh, the Mycenaean Greeks um, begin to look different from their descendants 
um, only when we look at their monolithic political structures. Uh, to put this in some context, uh, in her introduction, Paul lists 10 general characteristics of ancient Greeks. They were seagoing, suspicious of authority, individualistic and inquiring, open to new ideas, witty, competitive, admiring of excellence, articulate, and addicted to pleasure. Um, so Hall is saying here, right, that the Mycenaeans look pretty Greek other than their apparent uh, lack of suspicion of authority. Um, this emphasis on the political organization of the late Bronze Age is frequently commented upon by ancient historians. Um, and one last example to show that this is not purely an Anglophone phenomenon is Christian Meyer's book, um, here translated into English, right? Uh, as far as we can tell from the numerous and often grandiose remains, Mycenaean culture was monarchic in both organization and character. It was a palace culture. And he continues, and Mycenaean kings seem to have ruled over large territories. These are the two of the major differences between Mycenaean and post-Mycenaean Greek culture. And then he adds, there is no road that leads from Mycenaean to polis-based culture. All the fundamentally new aspects of this latter culture, which turned world history on its head, could not have arisen easily had the foundations, forms, and limitations of the preceding period not been destroyed. And then he continues, and notwithstanding a small and on the whole insignificant number of uh, continuities, had the post-Mycenaean Greeks not had the chance to begin again from scratch. So I think uh, Meyer makes explicit here what Cartledge calls a false start, um, that there's no meaningful line that connects the dots uh, between the Mycenaean Late Bronze Age of Greece and the polis because of these kind of irreconcilable cultural differences. So in my paper today, I, wa I wanna argue that this conception of the Mycenaean Greek Late Bronze Age ultimately derives from the work of Moses Finley, whose journalistic and academic output immediately after the decipherment of Linear B in 1952, crystallized the view of the Bronze Age world as effectively Oriental in character. Uh, Finley's Orientalism has been noted by scholars, uh, most prominently Seth Schwartz. Uh, but here I wanna focus on the way that Orientalist schemes work on and distort the study of the Bronze Age. And ultimately, I wanna argue that these distortions are not limited to prehistory, but are part of a much larger master narrative about antiquity that implicates um, the periodizations that historians and archeologists regularly use to, to, um, to study the past. Um, this is also part of a larger project that I'm working on, working on maybe in scare quotes, um, which I'm tentatively calling Mycenaean histories, um, which argues that our models of late Bronze Age Greece are faulty in that they fail to account for most of our evidence, um, both textual and archeological. So my reaction to what I call the Finley narrative um, is really the starting point of this project, um, whose central argument is that the notion of a unified Mycenaean world comes at considerable theoretical and empirical costs, and that we need to move away from approaches in which the communities of the late Bronze Age are simply instantiations of a single type. Um, as Kostas Vlasopoulos has so carefully shown, the first millennium BC equivalent of this approach is the way that the Greek polis, and I'm quoting, came to encompass and serve all the needs of Eurocentric history. And how the polis served as a singular umbrella type to which all such Greek communities belonged. And of course, Finley played an important role in the emergence of this polis approach to Greek history, as Vlasopoulos has uh, noted. Uh, these Eurocentric narratives have, a important, have had important effects on Greek prehistory as well by transforming a geographical relation into a temporal one. Um, and finally, one more, one more thing uh, before I proceed. Um, I would argue that um, setting aside the kind of theoretical or political problems of the characterizations of the late Bronze Age that were produced by Finley and his successors, uh, many of them are manifestly false or at least dubious. Um, that is to say, they can also be refuted on empirical grounds. I'm not gonna get into those weeds for today's talk, um, but I will focus on them. Uh, so in this talk, I'll focus on them as, as narratives or schemes. So just kind of focusing on history of scholarship. Um, but I will be focusing on the empirical evidence um, 
and the difficulties that these schemes produce empirically in a talk that I'm giving on Thursday, um, this coming Thursday, that's November 19th, um, for the University of Washington's Classics Department. That's at 5.30 p.m. Pacific, um, so 8.30 East Coast time, and much later on the other side of the, of the Atlantic, um, if you're interested in hearing more. Um, and there's some other places where I can point you to if you can't make that Seattle talk. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give the information to Katrine so we can put it in the, in the show notes. Okay, so um, I wanna start by setting the stage a little bit. Um, so uh, for my purposes, the reality is actually um, uh, more complex, but the, uh, for my purposes, the first major synthesis of Greek prehistory was written by Christos Tsuntas. Um, first in Greek in 1893, you see the cover um, of my copy there, um, and then rapidly translated into English with some significant changes by J. Irving Manet, who was professor of classics at Brown University um, in 1897. Um, if you want to read more about Suntas, uh, I would really recommend uh, a series of articles by Sofia Butsaki. Um, they're really great. And as Butsaki has observed, um, Suntas was the most forceful proponent of the Greekness of Mycenaean civilization. So um, Suntas pre portrayed prehistory as the childhood, Ipediki Likia, of Greek civilization, and not only conducted the Mycenaean world to Homer, but also drew parallels to modern Greek rural life, thus establishing a continuous history of Hellenism from prehistory and classical antiquity to Byzantium and the modern nation state. Suntas was clearly influenced by contemporary trends in Greek historiography, which stressed the continuity of the Greek nation from Homer onwards. Um, so archeology span um, was adding an additional chapter at the start of the history of the Greek nation, so to speak, and Mycenaeans were effectively cast as proto-Greeks. This view of Hellenism as an unbreakable continuity was a local Greek development, right? What Yanis um, Hamalakis calls indigenous Hellenism, in contrast to Western Hellenism, which effectively ignored post-classical Greece, um, and actually even ignored parts of classical Greece, right? So um, for some of these early um, Hellenists, um, the end of Greek history was the Battle of Chironia, right? So once, once the Macedonians get involved, it's, it's all over. Um, but certainly, you know, Byzantium, um, the Turcocratia, the Ottoman period, right? Those were, those were not Greek. So the modern Greek state was a rebirth of classical antiquity, but not anything after classical antiquity. So tight was the clamp around prehistory and later Greek history that Suntas asserts that had the Mycenaean world not collapsed, the world might not have to have, the world might not have had to wait. Sorry, I can't say this quote. The world might not have had so long to wait for the Phidian bloom, right? So the collapse of the Mycenaean world is this kind of like event that interrupts the natural unfolding of Hellenism. Uh, Suntas was also eager to show that prehistoric Greece was Western and European and not Oriental. So here's this long quote, the Mycenaean world was of the West, not so much geographically as in its whole spiritual attitude. It was forward thinking and forth putting. It had in it the promise and potency of what Europe and America have now wrought out in the complex of modern civilization. Um, so not only was the Mycenaean world spiritually Western, it was also racially European. So Tsuntas accepts the argument that the Mycenaeans were Aryan invaders. Indeed, he bends over backwards to prove that the, that the basic architectural forms of Greek prehistory derived from European prototypes, also seen in the Swiss lake dwellings and in the Italian terra mare. Um, and Tsuntas repeatedly calls the Mycenaeans Europeans, um, both in the English text and in the Greek text. Um, Suntas deploys a whole series of Orientalist tropes, right? Mycenaeans were independent and vigorous. Their arts displayed a creative genius still unfettered by types and conventions, thus proving, and, and this argument is explicit, um, that their art could not be Oriental. Okay, so um, the decipherment 
skipping ahead now, the decipherment of linear B two generations later by Michael Ventris um, in 1952 confirmed that the Mycenaeans spoke an early form of the Greek language. And for many, this discovery encouraged the view that there was no meaningful difference between prehistoric and historic Greece. Um, Tsuntas didn't know about linear B, um, and he assumed that the Mycenaeans didn't need writing. Um, so his argument is independent of this linguistic argument. Um, thus, Alan Wace could write in his preface to documents in Mycenaean Greek, the first substantive presentation of linear B text after the decipherment, um, that the importance of Mr. Ventress's decipherment can hardly be overestimated for it inaugurates a new phase in our study of the beginnings of classical Hellas. We must recognize the Mycenaean culture as Greek and as one of the first stages in the brilliance of the Hellenes towards the achievements, um, towards the brilliance of their later amazing achievements. In culture and history and in language, we must regard prehistoric and historic Greece as one indivisible whole. So it's into this scholarly environment that Finley introduces his own narrative, which was at the time heterodox, but now I think quite orthodox. So Finley published in 1957, a long review of documents in Mycenaean Greek um, in the um, Economic Historical Review entitled The Mycenaean Tablets in Economic History. Um, and another article in Historia entitled uh, Homer and Mycenae Property and Tenure. He also appeared on the BBC radio in March of that year, 1957, to discuss the significance of the decipherment in a program called The Great Decipherment. As far as Mary Beard could determine, this was the first of Finley's many ventures into journalism. Um, in this year then, Finley sketched out the main features of his model of the Mycenaean world. So Finley's, uh, the core of Finley's argument is that the tablets reveal a far reaching and elaborately organized palace economy of a broad type well attested and heavily documented all over the ancient Near East. Such an economy was unknown in Greece after the fall of Mycenae. He goes on to suggest that the palace economy covered the entirety of the economy, covered the whole economy, and that the absence of verbs meaning to buy, sell, lend, or pay a wage suggest, and I quote, a massive redistributive operation in which all personnel and all activities, all movements of both persons and goods, so to speak, were administratively fixed. This is a surprisingly, I think, stark picture of an oppressive, all-powerful economic and administrative uh, system. For Finley, this picture, the system, was totally unlike anything that came later in Greek history. Indeed, in the world of Odysseus and in other articles, Finley argued forcefully that enormous discontinuities marked the transition from the end of the Bronze Age um, into the Iron Age, such that it made no sense to look to Homer to understand the Bronze Age, and vice versa. Finley also asserts, and this is for Katrine, never in the Greek world proper, that is excluding such basically alien societies as Ptolemaic Egypt, do we find palace complexes, archives, or a palace economy like the Mycenaean. Because the Greek language survived, many Mycenaean terms lived on too. But it's a mistake to assume that where institutions are concerned, their meanings remained essentially unaltered. So the system we see at Mycenae um, is fundamentally unhellenic. Rather, it's Near Eastern, and Finley urges historians to look for parallels in the contemporary societies of the ancient Near East with which to establish a typology um, which, that will include the Mycenaean world. Finley isn't optimistic that the Mycenaean evidence will contribute much to this work, um, but he does say that it helps free Asiatic society from its traditional links with both the Orient and the inundated river valleys. So, the, the use, the utility of this typology for um, sort of world history is that um, Asiatic society intrudes into Europe, right? At least in the Greek Bronze Age. In his um, BBC interview, Finley is even more forceful and direct. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank the BBC archives and especially Samantha Blake um, for um, her assistance in acquiring the transcript of this uh, interview for me. So Finley begins his remarks as follows. The most striking thing about Mycenaean society is that it was not Greek. Some members of that society spoke and wrote the Greek language, but the civilization was not in any proper or significant 
any significant or proper sense that which we know is Greek. And that's the title of my talk. Um, he adds that taken whole, the palace structures were as un-Greek as the inventories which were kept in their monument rooms. Monuments are, I had to Google this, these are documents often found in an archive. I've never come across this word and I work on documents and archives, um, but there you go. No Greek king or tyrant ever sat on a throne in the center of such a labyrinth of chambers and storerooms. Um, so here we have, I think, the logical extension of Finley's earlier statements. Mycenaean society was palatial, hierarchical, and redistributive, and that for Finley is just fundamentally un-Greek. Um, and he makes this clear later in his remarks. Um, again, in the, in the interview at the, on the BBC, Mycenaean society was hierarchical and bureaucratic, bureaucratic in a way and to a degree for which there is not the slightest parallel at any time in Greek history, from the world of Odysseus to that of Plutarch and Lucian a thousand years later. On the contrary, the essence of Greek society lies in its relatively simple class structure and in the absence of bureaucracy and of the bureaucratic mentality. Um, so where do we find the ancient, uh, where do we find the bureaucratic mentality in the ancient world? Um, in the ancient oriental world, right? Um, those are Finley's words, not mine. Um, so the Greek world, um, on the other hand, was totally different. Um, Finley, Finley continues, the world that I've been calling Greek um, was the world which produced the poetry of Homer, Sappho, and Euripides, the philosophy of the Ionians and Plato and Aristotle, the science of the Hippocratics and Archimedes, the Parthenon and red-figured vases, and the sculpture of Phidias and Praxiteles. It was the world which discovered the rational, free individual and the possibility of a community of free individuals. So Finley, as he admits, doesn't really define Greek culture. He rather enumerates um, sort of characteristics. Um, and his, his picture of Greek culture is remarkably traditional and conservative, right? So traditional and conservative that Lewis McNeese was already making fun of this in 1938 in his poem, The Autumn Journal, right? The glory that was Greece, put it in a syllabus, grade it page by page to train the mind or even to point a moral for the present age, models of logic and lucidity, dignity, sanity, the golden mean between opposing ills, though there were exceptions, of course, but only exceptions. Um, at the end of his remarks, then, Finley puts it all together. I suggest that the destruction of the Mycenaean civilization was a necessary condition for the rise of Hellenism, so the opposite of what Suntas was suggesting. A living, functioning, bureaucratic society like the Mycenaean could not grow or evolve into the free world of the city-state. It could move only as the comparable world of the Sumerians and Babylonians moved, and that world, as we well know, produced no Homer, no Plato, and no Praxiteles. So I'm sorry for quoting so much Finley, um, but I do think it's somewhat necessary to establish the totality of his vision, which I think we can all agree is thoroughly Orientalist. And I imagine we don't have to, I don't have to argue that point um, to you, so I'm not going <laughs> to bother. But I also think it's fairly clear how closely Finley's comments align with quotes that I began this talk, right? T quotes by Paul Cartledge and others, so that although the Mycenaeans are Greek in language, they're actually Middle Eastern in spirit, um, and they're thus a false start uh, for the emergence of Hellenism. Now, I think all of this is wrong. Um, obviously, I think the hard work of, text of archeologists and textual scholars have demolished much of this model on empirical grounds. Um, but despite the amazing explosion of research since 1957, most Greek historians continue to repeat Finley almost word for word. And I could quote other stuff like Josh Ober's new book about um, the emergence of Hellas, um, any number of Greek history textbooks. They, they all, all is too strong. Many of them, most of them, um, repeat some version of this narrative. So the question is, why would Greek historians continue to repeat this narrative um, if it doesn't tally with the empirical reality? Um, of Mycenaean studies. I think that the answer has to do with um, a master narrative of Greek, of Greek history. Um, so if you, um, in the political unconscious, uh, Fred Jameson writes that um, the larger issue is that of the representation of history itself. There is in other words, a synchronic version of the problem, that of the status of an individual period in which everything becomes so seamlessly interrelated that we confront either a total system or an idealistic concept of a period. 
And I think this is clearly what we're confronting in the case of the Mycenaeans, right? An individual period that has become a total system, an ideal type of the bureaucratic redistributive despotism, right? And, and Finley is regularly criticized, in fact, for constructing such totalizing systems, especially but not exclusively by Costas Vlasopoulos. Um, Jameson uh, continues that, um, and there's, there's also the problem of, uh, there's the diachronic version of the problem in which history is seen as some linear way in some linear way as the succession of such periods, stages, or moments. And he continues, I believe that the second problem is the prior one and that individual period formulations always secretly imply or project narratives or stories, narrative representations, of the historical sequence in which such individual periods take their place and from which they derive their significance. I, I really can't think of a better example of this phenomenon than uh, Greek history. And I think it explains a lot, right? Why, for example, would Cartledge begin his history of Greece with the Bronze Age only to declare it un-Greek? If it's so irrelevant, why not simply begin with the early Iron Age or with the eighth century BC, right? Why summon the Bronze Age only to dismiss it? I think Jameson's formulation allows us to see why the Bronze Age and its total system is useful to Greek historians. It allows them to tell a story that transforms a spatial orientalist opposition, East versus West, into a temporal orientalist sequence, Bronze Age Greece versus classical Greece. Thus, the Greek peninsula experiences an internal transformation from despotism to democracy. And so it internalizes a story of Western civilization, right? A story in which the ancient Near East serves only to introduce cities and civilization but it can't advance the ball beyond this point, um, to use a sporting metaphor, right? As Finley put it, a living, functioning bureaucratic society could not grow or evolve into the free world of the city-state, right? So the, the destruction of the Mycenaean palatial system therefore constituted, as Sue Langdon put it in 1997, a liberating event that admitted exciting transformations into a somewhat static Bronze Age world. And actually this whole project started with me reading that quote and thinking, that's a weird way of thinking about it. Um, so paradoxically then the Orientalism of the Bronze Age serves to confirm the distinctive qualities of Hellenism. Um, we see this also in uh, Sigurd Digger Yalkozzi's discussion of the, the place of the Mycenaean um, palace system. And she concludes her discussion um, with the statement that in my view, the Mycenaean palace system was bound to fail because it rested on principles which were not in keeping with the, with the Greek conditions. The Greeks themselves seem to have preserved a quite ambiguous attitude towards this great era of their past. Of course, these tales cannot be taken as a historical tradition, but they may well have transported the message that the Mycenaean palace system was not a suitable kind of government for Greeks. Now, I should say that her previous discussion, uh, Degor Yakotsi's previous discussion, seems to indicate that by Greek conditions, she means the natural resources of the Greek mainland, right? Because earlier in her article, she suggests that the system was doomed to fail because it wasn't suited to the physical setting nor to the geographic conditions of Greece. But this notion that the palace system was not a suitable kind of government for Greeks suggests something quite different. Um, and earlier in her paper, she suggests that the palace system was introduced to the Greek mainland, the idea of it from the ancient Near East. And so the palaces are thus, for some scholars, an essentially foreign imposition that Greeks had to throw off. That is, underneath a veneer of Near Eastern palatial culture, the real Greeks were waiting for their chance to be free. And Chester Starr implies something similar in his Origins of Greek Civilization, written back, admittedly, in 1961, when he writes, the Mycenaean world was far too attached to outside models ever to develop an independent outlook of its own and that once the palaces collapse, quote, men were set free to create new political and intellectual views once the worst of the chaos was over. Um, so the Bronze Age is this kind of like self, uh, um, yeah, kind of self uh, repression of the Greeks. So um, where does all of this leave us? Uh, I hope that you agree that the story that we've been presented here requires some pretty 
present some pretty serious um, theoretical and political problems. Um, the first is the way that the story requires monolithic and essentialized blocks in order to work, right? There's a single monolithic Mycenaean world contrasted to a monolithic the Greeks, right? And even if you didn't know anything about the Greek Bronze Age, I would expect you to be suspicious of the claim that the Mycenaean palatial economy was totalizing and absolute, that Mycenaean culture was a monolith, right? So that the total systems were presented in the standard narratives are literally unbelievable. Such narratives are also fundamentally ahistorical because they don't explain anything. They reduce, as Eric Wolf put it in Europe and the People Without History, dynamic interconnected phenomena into static disconnected things. The second millennium BC, like the first millennium BC in the Aegean was a big and diverse place. Um, for example, there are nine good candidates for My Mycenaean palaces, um, setting aside chronology for the moment. I'm showing them to you here. Um, not all of these were used as palaces at the same time. So um, three of these sites were, were probably not palatial by the, the time of the final destruction around 1200 BC. And between these sites are huge areas that were fully Mycenaean in terms of their material culture, but apparently lacked palaces. So reducing the Mycenaean world to linear B and palaces is just as nonsensical as reducing classical Greece to Athenian style democracy. So seen in this light, it's remarkable and, and hard to believe that the standard narrative has had any staying power, right? The only explanation that I can come up with is not particularly encouraging that the field of ancient history remains deeply committed to an Orientalist narrative in which ancient Greeks stand alone and apart. And this narrative is baked into our most basic tools, um, periodization and culture groups. So for example, um, so central is the palace to the Mycenaean world that it structures internal periodiz periodizations as well. The Greek mainland in the late Bronze Age is typically broken into three periods the pre-palatial period, sometimes called early Mycenaean, the palatial period, and the post-palatial period. And it's usual to discuss the palatial period as the, quote, fullest expression of Mycenaean material culture, thus positioning it as the teleological destination of Mycenaean history. The problem is, of course, as I've mentioned, not every part of the Mycenaean world had a palace. So does Arcadia have a palatial period? The usual answer to this question is no. So for example, Cynthia Shelmerdine and John Bennett, oh, there they are, um, suggest that regions such as Achaia and Laconia apparently never developed palaces. They wrote this before Ayos Vasilios, that's not their fault. These areas may have continued to operate at the level of the early Mycenaean village-centered societies. So these so-called peripheries are thus not just peripheral in spatial terms, that is to say they're far from a palace center, but they're peripheral and temporal ones too. They're stuck in the pre-palatial past, right? So central is the palace to Mycenaean studies that its leading scholars cannot imagine a possibility for social organization other than the hypothesized period-based societies of the pre-palatial and palatial periods, right? So if, you, if you're in Arcadia, you're either, you're in the pre-palatial period. I guess if you move to the Argolid, then you're in the palatial period. Um, I'm reminded of Thucydides' observation that Aetolians and Acarnanians bearing arms in the old fashion, right? Um, the past still living in the peripheries of the Greek world and the allochronic discourses that Fabian traces in time and the other. Um, the question is what baby will we have once we've thrown out the bathwater? Um, I personally don't think that we can liberate ourselves from these narratives if we continue to rely on standard periodizations and, and cultural divisions. If we insist on the unity of the Mycenaean world and a linear historical evolution for it, we will inevitably be drawn into a narrative of Greek exceptionalism, either one derived from Tuntas's essentializing indigenous Hellenism or one derived from Finley's essentializing Eurocentric Western Hellenism. I think we need to insist on describing and explaining dynamic interconnected phenomena that are studied from the ground up or we'll just end up where we started drinking old wine in old bottles. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for this excellent and uh, thought-provoking talk. Um, so I'm inviting uh, all of you who have questions to type them in uh, the chat box, and I'm going to ask the questions 
on your behalf uh, to Dimitri. Uh, I might start. Um, I have a lot of thoughts and these quotes are just amazing. I won't expand on that. Uh, I was thinking when you were talking, Dimitri, about um, this idea of uh, cognitive dissonance. And it seemed to me, as you were reading the quotes from Finlay, that one gets a sense almost that as we, people were able to read the content of the tablets, there was this idea that palaces were equated with the Orient somehow and that there was this inability to reconcile Greekness and whatever is deemed the Orient together. So, so the solution is to not contaminate period, later periods by just containing that as separate, right? Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you think this idea of cognitive dissonance can, can be useful. And as a second question, I'm also wondering where, I guess this is another topic, but where would you fit the minuans in these uh, conversations? Yeah, um, I guess I can start with the second first question first. I mean, I think that there's been a, partly what I'm responding to is there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of work on, among Minoanists to think seriously about the legacy of, of Evans' discovery of the Minoans and the sort of Victorian um, overtones of Evans' discovery and the positioning of the Minoans as the first European civilization, right? And so there's a really interesting discourse there um, that's been going on for some time. Um, but uh, should I stop sharing my screen, by the way? Oh, I stopped it for you. <laughs> oh, you did? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. cool. Never mind then. Um, so, uh, so yeah, in part I'm responding to that, you know, like I was reading that stuff and thinking, oh, there should be more, people should be thinking about this more for the mainland too, you know, and I think Sophia's Butaki's work on Suntas is, is in some ways the, the, um, you know, the best place to find that kind of literature. Um, and then Vlasopoulos talks a decent amount about it um, in his Unthinking the Greek Polos book as well. Um, and that sort of reading that book, rereading that book was a big part of um, my thinking of, on, in this project. Um, so yeah, the Minoans, I think for Finley would be in the same boat as the Mycenaeans, right? They're both Bronze Age palace-centered economies. Um, Suntas, of course, doesn't was writing before the discovery of, you know, the Minoan past. So for him, Mycenaean means kind of everything prehistoric. Um, but because he, because he, I mean, because he, he is mostly talking about what, what we would call Mycenaean, right? And in, um, in, in his book, um, he's mostly focusing on shaft grave uh, material and later material from the mainland. Um, the cognitive dissonance was the first part of the question, right? Um, yeah, you know, I was thinking when I was finishing up this paper, I was thinking a lot about the way in which this need to cut out and excise periods of Greek history that one doesn't feel like dealing with. And you see it a lot, right, in this kind of like, I mean, you know, you see it a lot in the early history of the Greek state where it's like, okay, we're just going to ignore everything either everything after kind of like the polis, um, you know, Athenian democracy, or we're gonna ignore everything after Alexander the Great, right? Or we're just, or we're gonna ignore, we're certainly gonna ignore the Roman um, occupation. Anything that ends in kratia in Greek, we're gonna ignore, right? So the, the Roman occupation, the Ottoman occupation, the Venetian occupation, right? We're just gonna ignore all that stuff. And we're just gonna draw straight lines from Pericles to the modern Greek state, right? And um, yeah, the Byzantine past, we're gonna ignore that too, obviously, right? Um, cause, it's, Cause it's monarchical um, and we don't, uh, we don't want, you know, that's not, that's not the Greek, that's not the Greek legacy. But, you know, there's this interesting, you know, um, you know, Hertzfeld has written a lot about, I mean, a lot of people have written about it, but maybe Hertzfeld has written about it most incisively this way, the way in which modern Greece, you know, this, the, the, the sort of dual identities of modern Greeks as Hellenes on the one hand and as Romy, 
on the other hand, right? And the sort of like simultaneous, like classical and Ottoman inheritance in modern Greece, but, but there's no room for that in these discourses, right? It, there's no room for a kind of coexistence of two elements. One has to be dominant over the other. Um, so even in this, even in the among the people who think that like Greeks were sort of secretly longing to be free, you know, even in the Bronze Age, um, it's so totally repressed by the system um, that it can't really find any real expression until that system is dismantled. Um, so yeah, it's 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 odd because it yeah it refuses to like see any it refuses to see any kind of complexity like if there were palaces ipso facto they weren't greeks um and so that i guess means anybody any any greek who lives in a palace ipso facto isn't a greek um so that's why we that's why we have to describe the ptolemies as aliens um right don't even describe <laughs> <laughs> that just amazing i took a screenshot let me say um okay so we have quite a few questions. Uh, the first one is by William Malton, who's asking, were temple records in classical Greece similar to palace economies? Um, temple records in classical Greece. I know, um, were they similar to palace economies? Well, I, sp I guess the question is like, palace economies is, well, I, I'm not, I don't have a good answer to that question. First, because I'm not an expert about temple records in classical Greece. Um, but I guess the other issue too is like palace economies as I understand them, as Finley understood them. Um, I think the answer is no. I mean, there are some similarities. I know that people have compared, for example, temple inventories um, from classical Athens to the kinds of inventories we get in linear B. Um, I think the answer to that is no. I don't know. Someone else would be better at answering that question. Sorry, it's not a good, that's not a good, has a good a, answer. Yeah, if anyone has a clue uh, about that, just put it in the chat. I'll, re I'll um, save the chat for Dimitri. Um, then Megan Daniels uh, is thanking you for your beautiful talk. And then she says, I appreciate you bringing in Rasopoulos and Wolf. Clearly, these quotes do paint a one-sided narrative. But what about arguments in the last few decades that have moved against this dominant narrative? So she's thinking about Sarah Morris's 1992 uh, book, and even more recent work that really probes the continuity between Bronze and Iron Age. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, obviously that's part of the, the thinking here, right, is um, Sarah Morris's work, um, John Papadopoulos's work. I think, I mean, I don't know. I, I I'm a little I'm a little worried about framing the argument purely in terms of continuity and discontinuity, um, because I think it it still it still kind of treats the periods as blocks, and it I, there's a I don't know, there's a way in which I find it, um, you know, not to, you know, I sort of hesitate to say this because, you know, Sarah and John are, are both a lot smarter than I am. But like, I just think that there's something um, not quite radical enough about talking about it in that way. I know that the, it's become, I mean, I think it's a good thing. I can say that, you know, um, there's lots of recent work um, that has tried to, bridge the sort of late bronze, early iron divide. And to instead of treating them as two separate periods, right, kind of have a kind of bridging narrative where we're gonna bracket, say like 1400 to 700 BC, right? Like the Blackwell Companion um, that I contributed to. And then there's another uh, volume that has also has a bunch of really good articles in it. Um, you know, Sarah Murray's work, um, lots of people have been working um, on this kind of like, yeah, 1400 to 700 um, as a frame. Um, but I don't know, there's something about it that I feel like we need to, there needs to be, 
kind of more radical attack, um, or I guess I'm interested in, in mounting a more radical attack um, on the idea that, yeah, on the kind of on the on the on the blocks that com that comprise the discussion to begin with, you know. So there's you know there's I mean there's a lot of work in in archaeology on and history for that matter, right? On the the problems with periodizations and 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 culture um, sort of culture groups. Right, and there's a there is a tendency, I think, for a lot of archaeologists to see them as profoundly empirical um, and not theoretical constructs. But as lots of people have pointed out, like Gavin Lucas, for example, they are theoretical constructs, right? Um, uh, even if we don't want them to be. So I think there can be a you know I think a reasonable reaction to my talk would be to say, but like there was a, a Mycenaean world, like it makes sense to talk about the Mycenaean world, and it makes sense to talk about the Greek world, like these are meaningful categories um, of analysis. And yeah, sure, there are meaningful categories of analysis, right? Um, from way, way up. Um, once you start getting close to the ground, they don't, they don't mean very much. Like, what does it mean to call, if you say Arcadia was Mycenaean, um, I talk a little bit about this in a, in a forthcoming paper. Like, it doesn't actually tell you all that much, right? Um, because there's so much, because there's so much variation com contained in that um, label that it actually doesn't help you to predict all that much, other than they use Mycenaean pottery. I mean, that's pretty much all it tells you, right? Um, so yeah, I you're right. I should I should think more carefully about the counter narrative, um, especially of, of Morris and Papadopoulos, and how that fits into the scheme. Um, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Megan, thanks. Thanks for that. Thank you, Megan, for this question. Uh, the next question is from Denise Mikoski, uh, who's thanking you. And uh, she says the talk was great and really helpful for non-specialists as well, uh, who often take on these narratives without knowing how or having the expertise to combat them. Her question is, to what extent do you think these narratives also emerge out of the experiences and ideas of World War II? She is struck by the emphasis on bureaucracy and thinking about the theme of bureaucracy versus individualism in the, uh, the Shield of Achilles. Uh, she also thought of that in the final few narratives of Greece needing to overturn a kind of occupation of um, the Mycenaeans, meaning could the idea of Nazism also be haunting these narratives? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I've thought a lot about Finley. You know, wh why is Finley, why is Finley so committed to this narrative, right? It's really weird in a way. Um, the other thing that I, I left out um, is that uh, V. Gordon Child, um, the great, you know, prehistorian of Europe, um, also a dedicated leftist. Also, his narrative is also like thoroughgoingly Orientalist, right? Um, so his whole thing is that like metallurgy in the Near East was controlled by elites, and so it never. Whereas in Europe, it was it wasn't, and so it was there was this kind of like free market innovation that happened in Europe that didn't happen in the Near East, and 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 uh, and Child argues that. Um, that even in the early Bronze Age, you can see that Europe is like different in some qualitative way from the ancient Near East. And so it's weird that you have these two kind of, you know, I mean, I don't know if it's fair to call Finley a Marxist exactly, but leftists who, um, who adopt this really um, orientalized narrative and hypothesized models of the ancient Near East. And I thought for a while, maybe, they're getting this like Asiatic mode of production from Marx, right? And they're just kind of translating it. Um, but actually there are a couple of places where Finley talks about the Asiatic mode of production and, and he's really, it's, it's clear he's really up on the literature and he's thought about it quite a bit. And so I'm not sure that that really works. Um, yeah, so World War II, And Nazism. 
I don't know. I'd have to think about that more. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's I think that's a good idea, but I don't know. I spent last week reading all this all this stuff about Finley, um, but I didn't come across that stuff, um, which, which is interesting. Like Finley talking about the Second World War, but I can look into that. Not that it has to be from Finley itself, but it'd be it'd be useful to kind of tie it, you know, genealogically almost to um, to a specific person who's pushing these narratives. <laughs> I mean, co corollary to that, there's also the question of the creation of the State of Israel. I was wondering if this has in any way informed his uh, reflection on the region. Um, well, the, the Sus Schwartz piece is really interesting because um, Schwartz, what he points out is that Finley, weirdly for an ancient historian, almost never talks about ancient, ancient Jews. Um, they're like totally cut out of Finley's um, historical and historiographical work. Um, and it's something that Mamiliano also pointed out, and I guess tried to engage Finley with, and Finley kind of refused to engage. So Schwartz sees Finley's Orientalism as of a piece with his reticence to talk about Judaism, which is especially striking because Finley came from a really famous rabbinic family on his mother's side. Um, and talked about it, right? And and so it's interesting because you have like Finley and uh, Vidal Naque, right? Are are really? I need to look and be actually one thing I need to do for this project is um, look at Vidal Naque more closely um, because they're they're working together, right? And they see themselves as working together, but on sort of Finley more on the economic history side and Vidal Vidal Naque on the sort of social um, cultural side. Um, but they have similar ideas about um, the importance of democracy, right? The importance of the polis, the polis as this kind of totalizing model for ancient Greek history, um, and therefore the incompatibility of the polis with the Mycenaean um, palaces. Um, so Vidana would be another per interesting person to look at. Um, and of course, I don't know, I, I don't know what to make of the fact that these are all like, you know, Jewish intellectuals. I don't, so I don't know. I, I, I'd rather not speculate. I'd try no, to focus it was not so much that actually. Yeah. I, I will just specify the context of my of my little note to Denise's uh, question. When you mentioned in the talk this uh, much earlier idea of the rebirth of of modern Athens as well of of the let's say the Europeanization of modern Athens as kind of a rebirth, um, it kind of coincides with this uh, this courses about Alexandria as well, right? Especially starting from Muhammad Ali, you have this influx of, of a lot of migrants and this discourse about the recreation of a cosmopolitan state. And this strikingly also coincides with Zionism, which also bears this idea of recreating something ancient. So that was kind of the context of of my of my question. Um, so I mean. Yeah, I could also have asked about um, Alexandria, but uh, the, the creation of Israel is really a milestone that's happening not to within the context of Finley's lifetime. So, right. Okay, let's move on. We have two more questions. Uh, Joe has a question for you. Great talk, thank you. I'd love to hear more about how you'd characterize the differences between Suntas' original 1893 work and the uh, 1897 American translation. And in particular, to what extent the indigenous Hellenism survives or changes in the English version and what Manat brings to the book? That's a great question, Joe. Um, yeah, I read them sort of side by side. Um, and um, the, the English and the Greek together. Um, and I would say, so a lot of the stuff about Western Civ is much more prominent in the English version of the book than it is in the Greek version of the book. So that whole thing about, you know, how this is what Europe and America have wrought out in Western civilization, that kind of stuff is not really in um, Suntas's work. Um, but the 
um, the indigenous Hellenism stuff is, is definitely there. Um, so Suntas quite early on says that the, oh yeah, Homeric Greeks look back on the Mycenaean period the same way that modern Greeks look back on the Byzantine period. So he creates this kind of like double knot, right? Um, I guess like this, like a double knot. So yeah, Homer is to the Mycenaeans as modern Greeks are to the Byzantines. Um, and, uh, and he repeatedly uses, he repeatedly compares uh, Mycenaean practices to, um, to modern Greek practices, especially in villages. So, you know, for example, in uh, Suntas excavated the Vafio Tholos tomb. Um, and found a mirror in this warrior burial. And one way he explains the mirror is he's like, oh yeah, if you go to any Greek village, like shepherds always have a little mirror in their pocket that they use to like comb their beards and like mustaches and stuff. So there's this way in which he, draw, he repeatedly kind of cuts the corner, right? So he wants to create this kind of, um, one way of, right, of connecting the dots is to say Homer, Mycenaean world, one one nation, right? One all one in the same, but the, you can also cut the corner by just drawing direct parallels from prehistory to modern Greek, the modern Greek countryside. Um, and one thing I, I need to do for this project is do a lot more reading on um, Greek, local Greek ethnography, laographia, right? So the emergence of um, of the of the Greeks, the study of the Greek of Greek traditional life um, in the 19th century. So I think Suntas is kind of plugged into two developments. Um, on the one hand, this kind of historiographical tradition that's exemplified by Paparigopoulos, the Greek historian, right, who wrote this history of the Greek nation. Um, and on the other hand, with um, with Zabelios and that whole tradition of laographia. So I think those two things are kind of coming together in Suntas' work. He's trying to kind of merge those two traditions in a way in order to make the study of prehistory like, you know, relevant to the intellectual traditions of late 19th century, um, well, Athens really, I suppose, Greece, right? Um, so I think, I suppose Manat's um, view, the sort of, um, I guess I would say that yeah, Suntas and Manat is more Eurocentric, whereas Suntas is more, um, yeah, sort of Hellenizing, right? I don't, although he does call the Mycenaeans Europeans um, pretty pretty often, right? He's like the, the you know the Mycenaeans and their European relatives, you know this kind of this kind of talk. Um, yeah, Sophia does a good job, I think, of. Um, of, uh, of differentiating um, the, the different strands um, that we see in, in Suntas. So let uh, perhaps just end with a suggestion from uh, Lucia Nixon uh, in uh, response to Denise Mikoski's comment. It might be worth looking earlier than World War II um, with regards to bureaucracy. Uh, it may be that Paul Fussell's fantastic book, The Great War and Modern Memory, has something on this. Certainly, it's very clear that passports come in with World War I. Thank you for this uh, suggestion. Oh, Fussell. Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this for you. OK. Sorry, I'm taking, I'm taking notes in my notebook. <laughs> um, thanks, Alicia. That's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, Finley, when he's talking about the ancient Near East, he's really relying quite a bit on the great syntheses um, that were written in between the First and the Second World War. Um, so was it Anton Diemel, right? And uh, they're both in German. What's the other one? There's, there's two, um, both written in that interwar period. Um, So I think there there might be something there, right? Um, so am I understanding that there'll be a book out of this or something? This? Yeah, what? I mean, that's the idea. Please talk related to that. That's the idea. I mean, 
yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd like to do that. Um, but it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to see me carving out the time in the near future. So I don't know. I think the the paper that I'm going to submit to the um, to the volume that you're editing, Katrine, with with Ben, will be um, about this um, general topic. So that'll be my way of planting my um, flag in this territory. Well, so that's Megan says there's one more question from someone. Oh, yeah. Right in the I'm chat. Trying, I'm not trying in the chat. Okay, I'll just read it out because they sent it to me. <laughs> Is that okay? Go ahead, yeah. go ahead. In addition to problematizing the traditional narrative provided by historians about Near Eastern style Mycenaean palace systems, could we also draw on the increasing interrogation of overly centralizing reconstruction of Near Eastern and Egyptian Bronze Age palace economies as totality, totalizing systems in our understanding of Mycenaean political economies? So I think it's about, yeah, totalizing the Near East as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's the kind of interesting thing in a way is that, you know, Finley's right, but for the wrong reasons. Like, I do think that there are useful, I think that the, the ancient, the contemporary societies of the Near East or whatever we want to call, you know, East of the Aegean Basin, um, let's put it that way, um, are useful comparanda for the Mycenaeans. Um, but not for the reasons that Finley thought, right? That um, that they're uh, precisely because both have been, both of those models have been so um, severely abused by specialists, right? And so that it opens a space for um, this kind of, this is sort of what I was gesturing at at the end, that like, you know, one way of getting around these problems are like yeah, changing our chronological frame, changing our periodizations, right? And the other way of doing that is just to change our, um, the way we think of culture groups, right? So like, is there a good reason why we should, like, we shouldn't look at the cities and kingdoms of the Levantine coast, right? Like Ugarit, like why shouldn't that be part of the discussion? Is there a good reason to exclude it from the discussion? other than I can't read Ugaritic. Um, that's, I guess that's one reason. Um, but yeah, so why shouldn't we talk, just talk about these kind of small, smallish, late Bronze Age kingdoms um, or communities in, in a comprehensive and integrated way, right? Um, and, we, and, and, and to use them, you know, like I've, I've found I'll give one example. So um, early on, 15 years ago, I gave this talk in a, in a seriological workshop where I was describing how I thought the Mycenaean economy worked. And um, Piotr Steinkeller was like, oh, you've been reading a lot about the late uh, the old Babylonian economy, I see. And I said, no, I, I don't know anything about the late the old Babylonian economy. Um, it was kind of embarrassing. Um, but it was also like a useful um, confirmation, right, that what I was saying a wasn't totally insane, um, and B that it had like good parallels in um, in document in in communities that have much richer documentary traditions. So you know the big problem with the Mycenaean, no, the big problem. The, the one of the problems with studying the Mycenaeans is that all of our texts seem to be palatial um, and administrative, and so we don't have private archives. And it's precisely through the study of private archives that Assyriologists have been able to smash some of these totalizing concepts, right? And I think if we had if we did have the Mycenaean equivalent of those private archives, um, we would be able to attack um, these totalizing systems much more directly. As it is, we have to do it sort of indirectly, right? Um, and there's a long history of that. Um, I guess going back to, to Halstead's work in the late 80s. Um, so yeah, I think that there's, a, there's an interesting story to be written about the parallel tracks that, you know, um, the Aegean Bronze Age and the sort of Assyriological Bronze Age, those, um, the history of scholarship, but then also um, interesting kind of histories to be written that cross those borders. Yeah. This Sorry, that's a really long answer to your question. <laughs> this is music to my ears. <laughs> I love everything you said. I would frame it and put it on the wall behind me if I could. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for your generosity in, um, in giving this talk and accepting our invite and 
also in responding to everyone's questions. So those of you who I feel comfortable turning on your camera, we can give a round of applause to our guest today. Uh, thank you again so much, Dimitri. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for the comments in the chat, too. Yes, I'll send them all uh, to Dimitri. And maybe you've seen I've put the link to his talk of next week uh, in the chat box. And uh, if you're interested, we have one last talk for our series next Friday uh, with Tristan Samuel. So good to see all your faces. Thank you again, and you take care of yourselves.